number of processes that, that uh, milestones that have to be completed. Uh, if you do the arithmetic, uh, each one of these processes is going to take some time. There are a few interdependencies. There are some things that run in parallel. For example, once the design is approved, once we do the certification flight, uh, there are uh, pilot training requirements that have to be defined. Uh, we're bringing in international pilots to help us with that process. And then there will be a report that goes out for public comment. And uh, if, you, if you just do the math, uh, it's going to extend into 2020. So it won't be recertified this year. Do you expect it by the end of January or by the end of February? What, what would you it's, say is realistic? It's, it's impossible to say, Phil. I mean, if I, if I had that kind of a crystal ball, uh, I, would, I would certainly uh, be able to share it. But uh, it's very important that, that our team works very closely with the, uh, uh, the international authorities that have been working with us and with the, uh, with the Boeing team to do this right, and we're going to we're going to do it diligently because safety is absolutely our highest priority with this airplane. You've and made it clear it. here there is no plans to recertify this this year. It's not going to happen, and yet when we talk with Boeing, and we've reached out to them last week, they're sticking with this target of we expect recertification in December, potentially commercial service by the end of January. Are you frustrated that Boeing is putting that out there when the reality is the process is not close to that happening? Well, um, again, I understand that uh, a company, a manufacturer in this case, has a project plan with milestones and is devoting resources towards uh, moving things forward. Uh, but again, I've made it very clear that Boeing's plan is not the FAA's plan. We're certainly working very closely together, but we're going to... Uh, to keep our heads down and, uh, and support the team in getting this work done right. Has Dennis Mullenberg, CEO of Boeing, or any other Boeing executives, have they made uh, unfair requests, if you will, in terms of put pressure on you and your agency to speed up the process of getting this plane back in the air? Well, I've made it clear that I'm going to support my people, and, uh, and that means they're going to take whatever time it takes uh, to get this process completed and to do it the right way, uh, the way it should be done. Uh, having said that, uh, I would not say that there have been any requests to cut corners. There have been uh, discussions from time to time about uh, which processes run in parallel, where the interdependencies are, and those are that's uh, that's dialogue that uh, that is that is uh, that is not counterproductive. But I, I just want to make it clear that we are going to be very diligent about every step of the process, whether it's uh, training or uh, software development design. Uh, or uh, mechanical issues with the airplane. Steve, Andrew has a question for you. Andrew? Steve, um, there's a Wall Street Journal uh, report out this morning uh, suggesting this is going to come up during the hearing, so I wanted to ask about ask it to you in advance right now, uh, which is this internal report uh, from 2018, back in November, uh, where, this F where the FAA, in terms of analyzing, and this is now after, I believe, the first crash, uh, said that they believed that the, F the MAX could have averaged one fatal crash about every two or three years. So knowing that at that time, can you walk us through a little bit of just the thought process and also the pressures that, that the FAA may or may not have felt that they were under um, in terms of keeping that plane in the air? Sure. The, uh, the process that you're referring to is a, uh, a risk, uh, risk management process. And one of the reasons that we have the safest aviation system in the world in the United States is because uh, we are very data-driven, and, and our data systems have become more, much more sophisticated over the years. And as you have in, in many industries, uh, you use those, uh, that data and those tools to analyze risk. And so there were immediate actions and emergency airworthiness directive uh, after the Lion Air crash, and then the team came together as data came in to, uh, to develop a decision support tool to determine uh, how quickly uh, we needed to move forward with, uh, with the manufacturer with modifications to the aircraft. Steve, it was the, the, the fixes um, that were suggested at the time were inadequate, I think. is more. But, it, but I have a question. It, it says that some of this data-driven stuff, it's very conservative, and that it's sort of looked at as this is a worst case scenario that's not really reality and we're, we're talking about it if it's the absolute worst case this is what would happen so it seems like you're saying that so we don't really need to take it that seriously i'll bet you from now on the worst case scenario will be thought of as, as de facto wouldn't that be a better way to i mean why why do the data why do the analysis if you're not going to take it seriously 
Well, remember, uh, the uh, uh, grounding an airplane is uh, really an unprecedented decision. It's only really happened three times uh, in, in our history. And you, we need to understand what the causes of an accident are. And remember, MCAS didn't bring down this airplane by itself. Right. We had uh, maintenance issues with the aircraft. There are uh, issues with uh, how the aircraft was operated. Again, all of these things acting together uh, create a certain level of risk that we need to manage and, uh, and bring down uh, to, uh, to an appropriate level. And we also need to recognize, uh, I would be the first to say, that what we have done historically in terms of safety is not, gonna, is not good enough uh, today and right. it's not going to be good enough tomorrow. So we need to continue to refine and improve these processes. Hey, Steve, another question just about the airline overall. We've been talking about this for months and months, but the idea of is this an incremental change to the aircraft? And I think that gets at the question of what sort of pilot training will be required. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we haven't made a decision on pilot training. Uh, we, we don't want to keep our thumb on the scale on that, frankly. And, uh, you know, Boeing will make a proposal as part of this process, and uh, uh, we will have a team of 16 U.S. and international pilots of various experience levels and various backgrounds that will, uh, that will validate uh, the training uh, proposal in the simulator. And then after that, we will produce an addendum to the Flight Standardization Board report, which is the process by which uh, the airplane is, is certified from a, fr a training and operations perspective. And we want to wait to, uh, for the outcome of that process to, to make that uh, final determination. That, and that, that question of the process for the pilot training, this gets into, there's going to be a public comment period behind yes, some of will. these steps, which some of those may be, what, 10, 15 days? Yes, yes, So absolutely. even if you add that in, we're looking at a plane that may not be recertified until the end of January. Well, and, and, and you have also, even right now with the master minimum, minimum equipment list, the, the maintenance requirements, we're in a 30-day comment period for that, which started uh, about a week, a little over a week ago. So again, uh, you can just, as I said, you know, just doing the, the arithmetic on these processes, uh, you see that it pushes uh, into next year. Steve, one last question. Have you heard from President Trump about the MAX or from anyone in the White House who has said, look, we're coming up on nine months, it'll be a year, we need to get this plane back in the air, we need to get Boeing delivering planes again, it's good for the economy. Have you received any pressure at all from no, the No, I have House? not. No, I have not. This is, this is my decision. This is the agency's decision. Uh, Secretary Chow has been very supportive, uh, and the White House has been very supportive as well. Steve, thank you very much. Right, Steve thanks, Dixon, Bill. the administrator for the FAA, joining us exclusively here on Squawk Box. Uh, guys, just to put a point on this, am I correct? No certification this year. It's not It's not likely to happen or it won't happen. That's correct, and I'm going to fly the airplane as well, as I said before. Uh, we can't wait to be out there. See what you think when you land it. Guys, back to you. All right, uh, Phil. Th <laughs> yep, great. Thank you. Coming up, uh, another important interview with Ohio Senator Rob Portman on what a finished USMCA could mean for American workers and future trade deals. Also, keep, uh, hits keep on coming. Chevron CEO Michael Wirth is also set to join us after his company announced that it will take a $10 billion write-down on the value of uh, some assets, mostly shale, I think, and more expensive to develop. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box on CNBC. This CNBC program. You love tuning for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Towards the right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. To Search NFL today. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. In the stock market and in life. 
Everything can change from one minute to the next. Be the first to hear the latest money news and market trends with CNBC on TuneIn. Wherever your day takes you, listen to CNBC's full slate of programming, including shows like Fast Money, Squawk Box, and Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And when the next big business story breaks, CNBC lets you know with live updates and commentary. At the office, at home, or on the go. Search CNBC on TuneIn to listen. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. This is Brent Musburger. Search the Better Network. That's the B-E-T-R Network. And then let us get you better prepared to better enjoy the day in sports. The NFL, college football, basketball, hockey, baseball. Sharpen your edge. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Be better informed. Be better prepared. Search the Better Network. That's B-E-T-R. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium Membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Akina. Search NFL today. President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi finding common ground on a new NAFTA, a deal known as the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement. Uh, this, this hands the president a big win on his legislative agenda. Join us now uh, to talk more about the deal. Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, and he's also a former U.S. trade rep. So we had Senator Toomey on. He's got some issues. Um, the, you don't want to sacrifice a good... Uh, uh, in pursuit of the perfect, I guess, Senator. Yeah, well, look, this is a trade opening agreement, so it's good for us. It's good for Ohio jobs. Uh, farmers love it. Uh, manufacturers love it. It's going to be good for auto workers in the United States. There's a lot of positive things about it, and it, you know, it builds on the North American Free Trade Agreement that are already there, but it improves it and it updates it. So uh, this is a good thing for our country, and it's, it's great for economic growth. I mean, the GDP growth, Joe, is actually greater, as estimated by the International Trade Commission, than the growth we would have gotten from TPP, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which a lot of people said was the hallmark agreement we had to get it done, particularly on the Democratic side. So this is about economic growth, it's about jobs. Um, ITC also says 176,000 new jobs, more jobs in manufacturing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a good deal for America. Do you have any of the same concerns of uh, Senator Toomey uh, on any of the issues? Are the things that you would you'd change if you could if you were king? Well, um, if I were king, uh, you know, I wouldn't negotiate quite the same agreement, uh, particularly in terms of dispute settlement and some other issues that um, have to do with changes from the existing agreement. But look, this is this is better than the North American Free Trade Agreement in so many respects, and it's a great example of persistence and patience. You know, this thing was negotiated over the last couple of years. It was signed off on over a year ago. And it took the House a whole year just to say yes. Uh, it, it, it should have been done a long time ago because this could have started to provide benefits for the people of Ohio and around the country. But we're finally there, and that's great. And now we need to move forward on it quickly. A weird convergence of events yesterday. Um, obviously, it was, I mean, within hours, an hour, I think, of, of the other uh, big news of the day with the articles of, of, of impeachment. But the AFL-CIO, there was something going on for the last couple of days. I mean, it, was the timing, in your view, suspect? Or is that just the way that, you know, uh, Speaker Pelosi said, look, it, it gets done when it, it gets written up, and, and it's exactly yeah. the way it came in, and this is when I did it. Or was there, like everything else, was there a political um, tone to the, the timing? I, I think both, Joe. Look, um, it's, it, it is kind of uh, more than a coincidence that this happens to happen on the same week that impeachment is announced. I think this is something that probably the Democrats in the House uh, were looking to do because they've been criticized, I think rightly, by saying, people saying, you know, you guys are being distracted by impeachment, not doing the work of the American people. And this was a good example of it because this, this helps everybody and it's, you know, it's good for our country. So I think they kind of wanted to pair the two. Uh, but also, as you know, at year end, uh, Congress loves to put stuff off. So whether it's the appropriations bills that are hopefully coming together in the next few days here, 
whether it's USMCA, whether it's the defense authorization bill, which just came together yesterday, you know, after four or five months of negotiations, uh, things do tend to happen at the end of the year around here. So, uh, I, it, we didn't ask Senator Toomey much about this, but I, I just want to ask you quickly, and we don't want to dwell, dwell on this, but it could impact the markets, obviously, and, uh, and investors, but when they list the, the possible GOP senators that could, in some crazy scenario, vote yes on, on the impeachment at a trial, your name was actually in, in, I think you were like in the third tier. You know, you got your Romneys and you got your Lamar Alexanders and your Susan Collins, but then there was a next uh, level. I mean, it, the, the media entity writing it was trying so hard to get to 17. I mean, they were like, they were doing back, they were trying, just hope springs eternal. I mean, they were, uh, you know, just appealing. But you were there. Is there any scenario, anything else that could happen that would get you to a yes uh, in the Senate trial, Senator? Well, Joe, I, I don't know why I was on the list, uh, probably because I'm saying I'm a juror in the Senate and I'm going to listen. And I think everybody should listen. And you know, we should allow both cases, both sides to present their cases. And I think that's going to happen now. That's good. There was talk about the Senate not really taking it up. In other words, having a motion to dismiss right away. I think that would be a mistake. But I've seen nothing thus far that rises to the level of impeachment. And I think that's, that's really important that we, we focus on the fact that we have an election right now before us. I mean, you know, we've got presidential debates uh, going on. We have a voting in Ohio. Early voting is going to occur in about two months. Um, we've got primaries coming up in New Hampshire and other states, California. So, I mean, I think the American people are going to have a chance to go to the polls and express their views one way or the other. And those who would like to remove the president from office, they'll have their chance through the democratic process. I think that's a much better way to do this. So what would, the, in your view, what will the number be for the GOP? That, do you have any idea? It, will, will there be a couple of uh, outliers that, that go with well, the majority, or it would be the minority in the Senate, that go with the minority? Yeah, I mean, Joe, I, I, again, I guess it depends on whether there's something new. If there's no okay. evidence, if there's not, I, I, don't, I don't see that there will be anybody. You, they're, they're, the president says he really wants a trial because he wants to call Hunter Biden and Joe Biden and Adam Schiff. He wants all these people to be called, but... Uh, I don't think McConnell thinks that there's the necessarily the, the I think you need majority votes to call some of those witnesses, right? Yeah, you, you, you would and, and by majority you can do under the rules that existed in previous impeachments and look there's only been three in our country's history and none have resulted in a conviction, by right. the way. This is a this is an extreme measure to remove someone from office who um, you know, what, what's the feeling in American Ohio? People, is, this, so. is this bolstering Trump in Ohio or, or hurting Trump in, in Ohio? And you're from the I good, don't know. You're from the I good mean, part of Ohio. You're down in the yeah. uh, the Cincinnati yeah. part of Ohio. <laughs> oh, I beg to differ. <laughs> I'm not going to mention <laughs> any. I won't mention any names, but there Only are some. Green Toledo. All of them are great. Cleveland yeah, exactly. might as well be New York City. Great too. It's so we uh, love lefty. Cleveland yeah. is great. All of Ohio is great, Joe. Although I'm still a Bengals fan and a Reds fan. Oh, yeah, um, great, great football team down there. You got two. Are you going to pick that well, Burrow guy? You think? Burrow's I hope gonna... so. I mean, you know, the the, the the kid's from Ohio, so it's only right that he played for the Bengals. He's amazing. We've yeah. got a one and eleven please, record, so we, we should get the happen. we should get the first. Make first that round pick. Don't win any more games. Hey, you got the Patriots this Sunday. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, think you have to worry about that. Actually, I'm not sure. They they're kind of sucking lately. All right. Uh, thank you, Senator. Thanks, Joe. Huh? Good to be on. Good to be on. Yeah, I suck. Thanks, Hi, Senator. Hey, Andrew. Okay, Coming up. Nice <laughs> Thanks, Senator. Nice to see you, Senator. Uh, coming up, when we return, we're going to go inside Chevron's plans for a $10 billion write-down on the value of its assets. Chevron CEO Michael Worth is going to join us in just a couple of minutes. All of this happening on the first day of trading for Saudi Aramco. We'll talk about that and more. You're watching Squawk on CNBC. Yeah. I've got to tell you about our beautiful city break in Bath. Midweek is the perfect time to beat the crowds. Just an hour and a half by train from London. It was so relaxing. We headed straight for Bath Christmas Market. Oh, I can still smell the roasted chestnuts and mulled wine from the chalets. Then it was time for glow-in-the-dark mini golf. I got a hole in one. Well, three. I'm a bit rusty, okay? There's so much to do in Bath. I'm already planning my next trip. Discover the magic of Bath this Christmas. Plan ahead at visitbath.co.uk slash Christmas. So, Minister, how will your party combat the climate crisis? <laughs> Is there a deadline? <laughs> but is that too little too late? <laughs> Get an in-depth look at how the main parties are planning to tackle climate change. From the environmental crisis to the Brexit crisis, the Times and the Sunday Times will guide you through. 
Pick up your copy today or visit thetimes.co.uk. This is so difficult. What is Mark? Uh, buying Christmas presents. Who's it for? Oh, well, someone who has trouble unwinding in the evening and then getting up in the morning. Yoga retreat. Uh, anything cheaper. Hmm. How about the new Lenovo smart clock with the Google Assistant? You can set reminders, check the weather, and it's a voice-controlled alarm clock. Perfect. It's only fifty nine ninety nine. Save yourself 20 quid. 20 quid? Well, that's my present sorted. Make anyone's Christmas with the Lenovo smart clock at Curry's PC World. Take 26. Enjoy Taylor's Select Reserve Port, available for just £7.50, or Oyster Bay Sauvignon, and many more for just £7 each. Um, I know it's Christmas, but you're getting overexcited again. Our latest deal, co-op, is what we do. Offer subject to availability until stocks last on selected lines. See participating stores for details. Offer ends 3rd of January. Please drink responsibly. You never know where life will take you, which is why the new BMW 3 Series Touring is perfect if you're all packed up for... or escaping to... It has extensive storage and an automatic tailgate. Handy if your hands are full. And it even has an optional intelligent voice assistant to help you at every turn. The new BMW 3 Series Touring. Book your 24-hour test drive today. Test drive subject to status and availability. Participating retailers only. This week at Tesco, whole beef roasting joints and whole legs of lamb are half price. That's a whole lot of halves of a whole lot of holes. What a mouthful. Mm -mm. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Max 2 for customers, selected stores, excludes Express, ends 31st of December. Coming up, new data on consumer prices just a few minutes away. Squawk Box will be right back. Rainy, 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 rainy. Sergey, why are you in such good mood? It's raining. And? Rain means we take meal pups to cinema. And cinema means they'll be entertained. Ah, and entertained means they're also quiet for a couple of hours. Oh, let's go. Enjoy two-for-one cinema tickets for Meerkat movies when you buy through Compelza Market. Qualifying purchases chooses on Wednesdays, participating cinemas, two standard tickets only, cheapest ticket free, T's and C's apply. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. The game Search NFL today. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Hey, NFL fan. Can't watch the game? Can't be there? We got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side. Punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. To LeBron. Slam dunk. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. The Miami Heat are taking their talents to Texas to take on the second-year phenom, Luka Doncic, and the Dallas Mavericks. Back, trying to make it 11 to 2. This Saturday, the Miami Heat are at the Dallas Mavericks. Tip-off is at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. In the stock market and in life, everything can change from one minute to the next. Be the first to hear the latest money news and market trends with CNBC on TuneIn. Wherever your day takes you, listen to CNBC's full slate of programming, including shows like Fast Money, Squawk Box, and Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And when the next big business story breaks, CNBC lets you know with live updates and commentary at the office, at home, or on the go. Search CNBC on TuneIn to listen. Ooh. 
Welcome back to Squawk Box. Rick Santelli here, live on the floor of CME Group with November Consumer Price Index breaking. It is up three tenths, a tenth hotter than expected. And in the rear view mirror, up four tenths, unrevised. Strip out the all important food and energy known as core. It is up two tenths as expected. Year over year headline up 2.1. One tenth hotter than expected, three tenths higher than the rear view mirror. Finally, let's look at core on year over year where you strip out food and energy up 2.3, exactly as expected. So we could say a bit warmer, but maybe the point is that it is holding some of the monthly gains, of course, that we had last month. We'll continue to monitor pricing pressures on this, the last Fed meeting of the year, and on real average weekly earnings for November year over year, up 1.1. Average hourly earnings year over year also up 1.1. The market, well, we actually lost a half a basis point or so, 183 in a 10 year no yield. We failed on Jobs Friday to really hold very long above the mid 180s. Resistance considered 186 to 190 as we go into today's meeting. Andrew, back to you. you okay, Rick, thank you for that. I want to get uh, back to Steve Leisman now, who joins us with more. Steve. Yeah, um, as Rick suggested, a little hotter on the headline and uh, pretty much in line on the core. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is the base effects from last year. Uh, we have uh, sort of a uh, difficult comparison. So it's maybe a little bit hotter for that reason, but no real sign here of any concern for the Federal Reserve. Remember, their preferred inflation metric runs about a half a point below this one. So uh, two, three on the core might mean, I don't know, one, eight, one, nine on the uh, Fed's preferred indicator. Uh, so they're not going to see any particular concern. You do have uh, increases pretty much across the board in the zero, one, zero, two. Nothing big uh, standing out except for the 1.1% change in gasoline prices. I've been looking at um, things like uh, services up 0.3% and housing up 0203. Uh, so it, it's pretty much in line, and I think no big reason for the market to make a trade here on this issue of uh, the, the idea of inflation being relatively muted. Maybe the guy, Becky, that you have coming up can tell us what's going to happen with oil prices, and uh, therefore we get a better uh, look at what's going to happen with inflation. We're going to give it our best shot, Steve. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, in terms of what Steve was just talking about, oil major Chevron has announced that it's going to be taking a charge of at least $10 billion this quarter to write down the value of some of its assets. This is all related to what they think is going to be lower commodity prices as the industry deals with the supply glut. Joining us right now is Chevron CEO Michael Wirth. Michael, it's great to see you today. Good morning, Becky. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. You, you took a look at the assets and then decided as a company where you think oil prices are headed from here, and, 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 and what did you come up with that assessment? Well, business is good. Uh, we're leading our peers in total shareholder return this year. We've seen record production and free cash flow is growing. But good isn't good enough. So we're setting the standard higher for ourselves. We're streamlining our operational footprint. We're harnessing technology to drive efficiencies in our business. And we're simplifying our organization to get the right people on the right work, all of which are actions that will deliver even better results. The assets that you're writing down, tell us a little bit about them. These are shale assets. I think Appalachia is a big part of them. But talk a little bit about why you look at that and think that this is an area you need to write down. Well, we regularly take a look at our long-term outlook for commodity markets. And as we do that, uh, we also look at our assets. And uh, we evaluate which assets will deliver the highest returns uh, on investment for our shareholders. We've got a great portfolio of things to invest in. And uh, the assets in the northeastern U.S., along with some in Canada and other parts of the world, simply don't compete as well for our investment dollar as others do. We're staying very committed to capital discipline. This is the third year in a row where we've held capital spending flat. So we have to make tough choices to high grade those uh, projects that we'll invest in. And some of our assets may work better for others. You know, it's interesting. There's a, a lot there. You're talking about flat capital expenditures. It's, it's a big number, though, $20 billion. $20 billion is a big number. And so it's important that we spend every dollar to uh, generate strong results. Uh, if you go back uh, about five years ago, we were actually spending $40 billion. So we've brought our spending down as commodity markets have reset. And uh, I like to tell our people in a commodity business, 
capital discipline always matters and cost discipline always matters, and we intend to make the hard choices to continue to deliver leading performance. How have your production numbers held up in this time period where you've kept it flat for three years and come down substantially from where you were five years ago? We've seen growth every single year for the last uh, the last three years. Uh, we're showing a three to four percent growth again this year, uh, year to date, and so we've seen good, strong growth as we have opportunities to invest in projects that are highly economic. We've talked before about the Permian Basin here in the U.S., which is really the story driving a global uh, supply growth. Uh, so our production has grown and our cash flow has grown. So let's just focus on that. You're looking at places where you think you can spend less money and it's easier to get the oil out of the ground, and you think those are the assets that you'd like to double down on or maybe potentially buy additional ones there, get rid of some of these ones that are a little more difficult? Well, that's certainly part of the equation. The real uh, focus for us is on delivering strong returns, and, uh, and so the, the projects that have low investment costs, we can get uh, products to market and, uh, and deliver strong returns to our investors are the ones we're focusing on. The other thing that the shale has, which is nice, is it's a shorter cycle. So uh, roughly two-thirds of our spending delivers cash flow within two years, and that allows us to adjust capital spending to markets if we need to. So we've got uh, a budget that allows us to adjust. We've got the lowest break-even price to cover our dividend among our major peers and the strongest balance sheet. So that puts us, puts us in a very strong position financially to continue to support uh, cash distributions to our shareholders. In, in a world where, Mike, where it's Joe Kernan, in a world where we thought, you know, we were events are going to run out, this is a good problem to have, though. I mean, the, the, you could get this stuff out of the ground if you wanted at the right price, right? The, the stuff that, that you may not want to do, it's just for shareholder return, it might not be good. What, what price would you need uh, oil to be to, to, for, to not be taking this right down and, and to go ahead and develop it? Well, these are, these are primarily gas-oriented assets, gas, but I think okay. the, broader, the, the broader story here is uh, there's an abundance of resource in the world. We're not running out. Innovation and technology have allowed us to meet the world's demand, and it's a growing demand for energy in an even more efficient manner. And so we can do this at lower costs, which is good for economies, it's good for consumers, particularly in developing countries yeah. around the world. Well, we could always go back and get it, couldn't we, if... if, if at some kind sure, of cost. It's, yeah, it's at, at, a, at a certain cost. Did your, uh, you know, they, the, you're a chemical engineer from a great engineering department at CU, by the way, the Buffaloes, but uh, did, did, did that help you decide? I mean, some of these things that you do, I think I, I think chemical engineers should, should be hired for just about everything uh, because that's hard. you you got to go to school for that, and you got to actually work. Well, that's, uh, that's a few years ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a demanding uh, curriculum. And yeah. uh, we've got, look, we've got lots of smart engineers of all different types in our business. And uh, they're essential to, uh, to, to, to drive the innovation that is uh, really continuing to fuel, I think, this uh, uh, benefit to the U.S. economy and the global economy. Do you think that the ways. Aramco needs to write anything down? Well, I, you know, I don't know uh, the details of Aramco's business. They've certainly been in the news a lot lately. They're a great company with great people, and we've got a long history. Well, Michael, I imagine them. you've been watching this IPO process just in terms of looking at valuations, looking at different assets. Um, you know, I think we're all trying to figure out what to take away from this whole process on the valuation side, and then also on this sort of larger question about whether a company like that can ultimately land up on an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or in London and how that might change some of these valuations and how that might even impact a company like your own. Well, I think it's very early to speculate on that. This is a relatively small portion of their company uh, that they've made public. And, of course, we've seen this in other state-owned uh, companies in our industry and in places like China historically where they've uh, become publicly listed. And I think it's a gradual process that unfolds and markets uh, adjust to the information and the opportunities. And so this will play out over a period of time, and I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to watch how that, uh, how that plays out. Hey, Michael, you, you made the point that you're in a good position right now. The company has good times and good things that are happening. It is an unusual way to kind of go about a reorganization at something like that, uh, but it's probably the smart play to do. I've also seen, though, you make the point that you're doing this uh, because you don't want to wait for oil and gas prices to rise. If you look out for a long time, do you actually think oil and gas prices could rise down the road, or are we really in a secular change 
where this is a big glut for all sorts of oil and gas, and we're kind of awash in it around the globe, and, and you're not anticipating that we will see prices rise anytime soon, significantly. Well, commodity markets are, are difficult to predict, and if I could project oil price uh, accurately, I might be doing something else for a living. And so we, we try not to uh, build our business on a, a hope that prices will rise, but rather to take a look at the things we can control, which are the capital choices we make, uh, our costs, the way we invest in technology and efficiency, and be prepared to compete in any environment. And certainly today, we see a world that's well supplied with both oil and gas, and it looks that way for a period of time. But the long history of the industry is one of cycles, and uh, we need to be prepared for the market we see today. And if there's upside, uh, we certainly will perform even better, and uh, we've got a history of sharing that cash flow with our, with our shareholders. And so uh, that's, I think, the responsible way to run our business. For years, uh, Mike, the, the hydrocarbon industry has been pressured to, to try to transition away from, from your bread and butter and into renewables, and you know, I'm glad you didn't do it 10, 15 years ago because you, the shareholder return wouldn't, I don't know what it would be at this point, but do you feel uh, uh, a responsibility as CEO to start transitioning, uh, to start the company on a path to some something like wind or solar, or I don't know where you'd want to go, but do, do you feel you should be doing that now to, to for the future and uh, for all the ESG funds that might end up investing in Chevron if you were to do that? Joe, our company's been around for 140 years, and the story of that entire history is affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy production to meet society's needs. And so as we move forward, uh, we intend to continue to do that. Uh, that means that we'll produce the types of energy the world demands today, but we'll also look to reduce the environmental footprint of ours through uh, our own uh, carbon uh, intensity of our operations. We yeah. look to integrate renewables into our business where it makes economic sense. And we're investing in technologies that hold the prospect to provide breakthroughs for the future. Yeah. So we do all of those things as we still invest to, uh, to meet the, the needs of the world today. And of course, we have to be a strong, viable entity uh, in, order to, uh, in order to play that role yeah, long keep, into the future. Keep, keep drilling, Mike. I, I'm sure the time person of the year might not like you very much, or that answer you just gave. But, uh, I, you know, just uh, let's not go full, full bore into, you know, keep, keep uh, pumping the oil, please. Thanks. Hey, Mike, one more quick question for you. You did mention how you've outperformed your peers, and you have pretty substantially both for year-to-date and the last five years on a rolling average, but you've underperformed the S&P in both those instances. This is something that's plagued all the oil and gas companies. Why should investors put money into an oil and gas company at this point? Well, you're right. We have been out of favor in the, uh, in the broader markets, uh, which is one reason why we're, we're relying on self-help to improve, I think the, the most compelling metric to look at is free cash flow yield. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the cash flow that we're generating right now uh, as a company, our free cash flow yield is higher than any other sector in the S&P 500. So I think there's a real value opportunity there that investors will uh, will begin to recognize. Mike, thanks for coming on. It's great to see you. And uh, we hope to Becky, see you again great soon. to see you. Uh, coming up, can, uh, can Disney keep the magic going? We've got exclusive data on the popularity of Disney Plus next. Plus, the FAA chief making news right here on Squawk Box earlier this hour. Big news. You know, just doing the, the arithmetic on these processes, uh, you see that it pushes uh, into next year. Oh, we will get Jim Cramer's reaction straight ahead. At Indigo, our most ambitious project. You never know where life will take you. Which is why the new BMW 3 Series Touring is perfect if you're all packed up for or escaping to. It has extensive storage and an automatic tailgate. Handy if your hands are full. And it even has an optional intelligent voice assistant to help you at every turn. The new BMW 3 Series Touring. Book your 24-hour test drive today. Test drive subject to status and availability. Participating retailers only. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. 
Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Cutting for the net, scores! On the goal! Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And it tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Welcome back, everybody. The company says that uh, the day Disney Plus launched, the app was downloaded 10 million times to televisions, mobile devices, and desktops. It's now been four weeks, and we're learning more about continued interest in the service. Julia Borston has some new and exclusive numbers. Julia, good morning. Good morning to you, Becky. Well, today, Aptopia reporting that Disney Plus has 22 million downloads to mobile devices alone, and Disney Plus has averaged 9.5 million daily active mobile users, ranking number one in Apple and Google's app stores every day since the app launched. Now, these numbers only measure mobile use and do not measure use on smart TVs or streaming devices such as Roku and Apple TV. And we don't know how many of these downloads are seven-day free trials or are Verizon Unlimited customers accessing their free year. But Aptopia reports that Disney has already brought in $20 million in revenue from this app, a combination of per-month fees and annual contracts. Now, Aptopia tells us that Disney Plus's early success does not seem to be hurting mobile downloads or traffic to other streaming services, saying that Netflix's U.S. mobile app sessions briefly dipped, but then quickly recovered. Now, there are other apps benefiting from Disney+, Plus, including Roku, seeing increased usage, and Hulu and ESPN, their discounted bundle with Disney+, Plus driving downloads. Now, about 85% of Disney+, Plus's app downloads and daily users are in the U.S., according to Aptopia. It's only available in four international countries. Disney+, Plus will roll out globally, starting with Western Europe in March, and then to Latin America and elsewhere in the fall. We asked Disney about this data from Aptopia. They declined to comment. We'll have to wait to hear their official numbers when the company reports its fourth con- fourth quarter earnings. Andrew? Hey, thank you for that, Julia. Nice to see you. Uh, meantime, our next guest has a new note out this morning. It says there may be a liquidity problem developing in the S&P 500 and that investing has turned into an extreme sport with a hollowing out of the medium time horizon. So strap on your seatbelts, folks. Avita. Subram, I always said Subramanian. <laughs> now I'm supposed to say Subramanian. Don't listen to any of our conversations. It's really. hard for me, as you know. No, I, I want to get it right. about it. Head of U.S. Equity and Quantitative Strategy at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, is here. We've been seeing you for like so many onion. years and Super saying it wrong the whole time. <laughs> Everyone, we've, okay. Well, let's but let's get it's to this. Okay. Let's get to this new version. note, though. Yes, because so I this, think this is scary. Is and well, I'm, I mean, it's it's scary. I don't think it's something that's going to blow up in our faces, you know, right now. But I think there are there are certain things that are happening in the equity market that are very different today than what we've seen in the past. So first of all, if you look at pension funds, right. their allocation to illiquid instruments has increased from, you know, de minimis right. to almost a quarter of their assets. So their exposure to private equity and real estate today is much higher than it has been historically. So I think what we're worried about is if pension funds uh, that are exposed to illiquid assets that have benefited, so think about private equity and real estate. They've benefited from this super low interest rate environment. We've had a great IPO uh, market until right. very recently. Um, if anything challenges the private equity story and the, the valuations are marked down, Pension funds might be forced to sell their most liquid areas Stuff. of the portfolio, mm-hmm. which are basically S and P 500 but, index funds. Right. And, and I think, okay, hey, but how convinced are you that private equity has not marked stuff properly, and therefore the LPs, the pension funds, are going to have this 
potential problem? So I think that you know it's a it's a case by case basis, right. but I do think that we've been in an environment that has been super conducive to private equity, right? right? I mean, what's better than zero interest rates, super accommodative monetary policy, the tightest credit spreads around, massive appetite for equity for new issuance. So you know, if any of those dynamics change, I think that valuations are likely to be lower than they are today. And what's a and little how bit unnerving? Do you think that valuations are already? So if you not. look at private equity valuations, they're at, you know, on, on one measure, I think we looked at EV to sales, they're at all-time highs. They're higher than they were in 2000 during the tech bubble. Um, they're actually, in some cases, higher than public equity market valuations, okay. where, you know, private equity normally sells at, an, uh, at a liquidity discount to right. public equity, but today, there's no liquidity discount uh, baked into private equity. So that's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. Now, I said 25% of pension funds are in, in illiquid assets. That's not the, the whole kit and caboodle, but it's still enough to worry that, that in times of stress or in times of a liquidity crunch, there might be a rush to exit some of the more public uh, uh, You've liquid You've kind of had one foot out of the door for a while, I think. Of the market? Yeah. <laughs> right? So I'm just wondering, what do you think, where, well, you, a year ago, where do you that. think, what yeah. did you think the S&P would end the year out? Where, what do you think is fair value for, do you think we're way out ahead of our skis right now? What do you so, think, I mean, our, what is the our, fair value for the S&P right now? Yeah, our outlook for next year, we've got a 3,300 target on the S&P So above where we are. And, you know, yeah, we're, we're looking for upside. And I think the idea is that we've seen enough pent up CapEx, which could be unleashed next year. We've seen enough, you know, the, this this market has been, you know, the most hated bull market of all time. We all say that. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Asset allocators haven't necessarily pushed all of their exposure into equities. They're still overweight bonds and cash. But I do think that, you know, large U.S. mega cap tech companies are super crowded. I mean, again, you know, I've mentioned this on your program yes. before, but the overlap between hedge it's an important funds. important group, too. And, yeah, that's I in mean, the leadership. I can't see, you can't see big gains made without that group. Can't well, you? I think the market could continue to climb higher, but maybe not the same kind of, um, you know, outsized returns that we've enjoyed over the right. last few years. So so that's just something right. to keep in mind. Um, this is one of the reasons that we like small caps over large caps for next year. Do you have any, any views as we get into the last two weeks here? Last two weeks? No, no, no. Just yeah. the technical factors. I mean, You're always thinking about different technical factors. Yeah, so flows Obviously, we have the trade issue, which is probably, right. not, it's not a technical factor. It's a big one. It's a big mess. Big flag out there. Yeah. But then also, people want to be in certain names at the end of the year. Yes. For certain reasons. So the window certain people dressing. are doing some tax harvest. There's lots of Dynamics. Cross currents right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's no reason to sort of sell everything today, but I do think that come January 2nd, there could be a shakeout. So here's where I think that investors will make money is by shifting out of crowded growth big cap stocks into some of the more neglected deep value areas of the market, like financials, like, you know, select um, industrials companies that haven't really seen any signs of life. And now all of a sudden we could have trade resolution, we could right. have pent up capex spend. There's a lot of levers that could You're uh, betting on trade resolution. Pressed. I mean, I think that we get at least um, a delay or maybe a skinny deal. Okay, but um, no, no additional. Right, I, you know, I go. think it's hard to argue that 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 we're going to see tariffs um, put on consumer goods when we're heading into an election year, and that would really hurt Trump's voting base. I mean, it's a it's a tough uh, tough scenario to argue for from a game theory. Can I ask you a personal question before you leave? Oh no! no. <laughs> did did philosophy help with mathematics? Or did mathematics help with philosophy for your double major? That's a really interesting question. I think they were both. Um, I think they, there are things in both. There are uh, a lot of it's not a zero overlap. Overlaps, it? it's yeah. Like music and math, right? But I would say right. philosophy I, has helped me more in my career than anything else. Which is more than the mathematics in your more than math. That's crazy. Yeah, because I mean, I think the markets are imperfect. There's no answer. Okay. Tell me, I got to move on. They don't. Oh. They don't like the human interest uh, at Berkeley too. <laughs> okay, story. so it's not at. Uh, uh, you know, some community college. You know, so, uh, <laughs> anyway, Savita, thank you. Great and to I, be here. I Thanks. knew that there would be some. Uh, Kramer is a philosopher, uh, really. Of sorts. Of oh, sorts. Breaking news on Squawk and a mathematician. Earlier this hour, the FAA administrator telling us uh, this about the now grounded Boeing 737 MAX. 
Each one of these processes is going to take some time. There are a few interdependencies. There are some things that run in parallel. For example, once the design is approved, once we do the certification flight, uh, there are uh, pilot training requirements that have to be defined. Uh, we're bringing in international pilots to help us with that process. And then there will be a report that goes out for public comment. And uh, if, you, if you just do the math, uh, it's going to extend into 2020. All right, Jim, that's uh, right from the FAA administrator's uh, uh, lips to, to Squawk Box. What do you think? Well, I think that this is, again, what I'm hearing. It won't be until the end of 2020 that we see anything happen. And this thing gets pushed back. I, I was reading some old research about when this first happened. People were talking about how in May of 2019 they'd be back in the sky. So I, I continue to look at what uh, Southwest is saying, what Americans saying. Uh, what United's saying, because uh, to me, at a certain point, you have to wonder how much is Boeing going to have to pay these companies and what's Boeing's cash flow look like. Uh, so I, the stock, which is still up for the year, I think finally should get hit. Uh, th this was an astounding interview because what it says is anything that you heard that was bullish is just just not occurring. So that the, at this point, you would do what if as an investor with uh, Boeing shares? There's so many other aerospace plays. I don't know why you would want to be in Boeing. I mean, I think that Boeing is, uh, you, want, you want to have something like a Honeywell, which is that at least it's uh, not hostage to Boeing. United Technologies is not hostage to Boeing. Uh, because I think that Boeing is uniquely uh, bullish on what I think may be a bearish situation. Boeing has to come and just come out and say, listen, we got to revise 2020 down. We got to do it now. We're gonna, they should use Kaivon rumors numbers from Cowan. Uh, because I think that when you look at Boeing, I think you get kind of excited thinking it's about to happen. And every bit of news yeah. is bad. When was the last time we heard any good news? Yeah, good. True. All right, Jim, we uh, will hear more from you at 9. Uh, we'll see you in just a couple minutes. Don't miss an Thank exclusive. You. You're welcome. You don't miss an exclusive interview with Bank of American Chairman, America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan later on Squawk Alley. That's coming up at 11.15 Eastern from the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference. Stay tuned. Squawk Box. We'll be right back. Tasta packs of beer at just £12 each, including 24 bottles of Budweiser, 18 cans of Stella, or 12 bottles of Birra Moretti. Looks like you're hosting this year. Asta, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Budweiser 300ml, Stella 440ml, Moretti 330ml, excludes Scotland Drink Aware. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play -play games from NFL and MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your Tune In Premium membership, you already have an all access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line. Intercepted. Listen live as the action unfolds or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. This is Brian Musburger. Search the Better Network. That's the B-E-T-R Network. And then let us get you better prepared to better enjoy the day in sports. The NFL, college football, basketball, hockey, baseball, sharpen your edge. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Be better informed. Be better prepared. Search the Better Network. That's B-E-T-R. MSNBC is on TuneIn. Get up-to-the-minute coverage on news and events from around the world with MSNBC's live 24-7 station on TuneIn. 
at home or on the go, stay up to date on the latest news and political trends with MSNBC's full lineup of shows, including Hardball with Chris Matthews. Hi, I'm Chris Matthews. Thanks for listening to MSNBC on TuneIn. And The Rachel Maddow Show. Plus, when news breaks, MSNBC has you covered with live updates, expert analysis, and more. Search MSNBC on TuneIn today. Let's get a final check on the markets. Futures a little lower for the Dow. It's Dow down by just over eight points. And Joe, you were pointing out it's because of the losses in Boeing right now after that that interview with FAA. Mm -hmm. All right, make sure you join us tomorrow. Right now, it's time for Squawk on the Street. On the street, I'm Carl Quintanilla with Jim Cramer and David Faber at the New York Stock Exchange. Pretty steady pre-market on this Fed day. Decision at two o'clock Eastern, followed by Powell's presser. Lots to watch, though. Saudi Aramco, Boeing, Home Depot. As we wait for clarity on China tariffs, Europe is mixed. A UK election tomorrow, and then CPI just ahead of estimates. Core rate up two, three year on year. Our roadmap begins with an historic IPO. Shares of Saudi Aramco surged 10 percent in its debut. Now valued at nearly 1.9 trillion, the largest listed company in the world. Plus the Fed and a trade waiting game. Stocks are poised for a muted open as investors seek further tea leaves on trade and the fate of monetary policy. And monopolies aren't bad if they are not abused. Apple's Tim Cook coming to the defense of monopolies in business but says Apple isn't one. We'll begin with Saudi Aramco though. A strong public debut after raising a record $25.6 billion in the IPO. Shares jumped on the open, the maximum 10% on the stock exchange in Riyadh, limit up. As a result, the state-owned oil giant is the world's most valuable company listed at almost $1.9 trillion. That's about six Exxons and above Apple, which has a market cap of almost $1.2 trillion. Well, a well-placed deal. Apparently a lot of people in Saudi Arabia decided to buy the yes. stock, and that uh, boosted it. I think that they, you know, sometimes you get these deals and they pretty much determine where it's going to be. So now the question is yield uh, and whether the yield exceeds uh, what Mike Worth is offering on Chevron. And I think it will, but I don't think it necessarily makes people suddenly all excited about the oil stocks. But it does uh, say that um, there's appetite for equities, at least in one country. Uh, uh, definitely true. All those uh, hand-wringing about ESG, right, and how that might weigh on demand has not turned out to be a story today. <laughs> no, and yet, the, yeah, let's talk about ESG for a second. There's a piece from Morgan Stanley. Comes Katie out, Uberty, says, right? Evaluate, yeah, evaluate, Katie Newbury is very serious. Evaluating our information technology hardware coverage through an ESG lens. Do you know that there are machines, actual software, dedicated to find out how many times you mentioned ESG in a conference call? And if it mentions a, a huge number, then the stock gets bought. Um, it is, you know, listen, it comes up here in a way that we, I mean, a year ago, to, you could measure with us. No. Two years ago, five years ago, we weren't mentioning it all. Not we at all. it almost every day. Yes. But what is still awaited, I think, largely is a an ability to compare across industries and even within industries, metrics that can be used to actually measure progress that companies are making on their sustainability goals. That doesn't exist. Think about a FASB, but for ESG. That's Something really, along those lines. And that really is, they are, trying, they are working on it. There, is, there are efforts being made for essentially what would be called SASB, sustainability, and, and, and actually then be able to look at and believe all the different numbers you're getting to measure this because it's becoming such an important well, input for investors. 10 million people have accounts in Robinhood. And before they look at how the earnings are, they look at how the ESG scores are. Yeah. And you I seem think, Times Person of the Year this morning, Greta Thunberg. Greta, right? yes. Yeah, I was there when they picked her. <laughs> you were where? Well, there was like this. Oh, because it was Benny a, it, was a, it, it didn't really happen because it was, you know, it's um, for background. Right. But uh, I, I, what I thought was amazing was it was almost by. Uh, unanimous. Yeah, unanimous. Uh, there, was one, there was one guy who said Tim Cook. <laughs> well, uh, they do have you. Yeah. They do have uh, business person of the year. Ended up being Iger this year. Well, I like that. That good book that he wrote. Really uh, good book. Really good book. Yeah, really good. Should have retired before he wrote that book because it's very critical. Of certain people. Book, though, really well, nice. Uh, 
Nice. Did he mention Viacom? No, he didn't. Right. It just keeps going down. But back to oil for a second and back to Chevron okay. and Saudi. By the way, the Saudis, if you are an individual investor, you buy 10 shares, you hold it six months, you get it one additional. Do you share. really? Yes. That's part Shoot, of the that's fantastic. Not bad, right? Yeah. And of course, it ha- was not sold around the world. Goldman did that. It right? was sold, you know, largely in the, in the Saudi yeah. market. It is up 10%. It is the most ex- uh, most widely highly valued company in the world. How's that versus um, Uber in terms of like big IPOs? What do you mean? Well, one did better than the other. Yeah. Unicorn it, versus it, what? Uh, oh, Do you know that there were no financials to this company until recently? No financials. On Aramco. Yeah. You mean prior to the S1? Well, right. We, yes. we didn't know yes, whether they were right. doing was... well or badly. And so how do we know how they do if oil goes down? What do we? What do we say? I don't know. Or if they get attacked again? I'm still amazed that that attack happened when it's never responded to. What are you? Some sort of sorry. geopolitical? I'm sorry, I didn't see. just fascinating to think about it. Can you imagine if one of our oil facilities was attacked in this country? What we would do? Oh, I think that yeah, that would it would be different. Yeah, it would be different. Different. Be different um, but that continues to be a concern for investors as well. But not not within the country. And now they have an equity they can actually buy in Saudi Arabia. By the way, not dissimilar what? in some ways from Alibaba's listening in Hong Kong, where for the first time, really, the main customers of the service were able to buy the stock. But it's funny. I, I initially thought, well, maybe they'll use this uh, equity to be able to make some acquisitions. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times people just tell me they're going to use it to be able to diversify away from oil. Right. Although that doesn't always work. In the case of Chevron, for example, diversifying into natural gas or ExxonMobil, not necessarily well, the best move. Remember when it? Exxon diversified into Videc? No. You, you don't? No. They diversified into information technology. Oh, really? When yeah. was that? Uh, 1983, 84. Oh, that one I missed. Yeah. yeah. Well, you were in pajamas. Before our time. No, yes. I, was, I, was, I was in college, which my, <laughs> I was probably in pajamas. Yeah. Well, uh, David and Jim mentioned the, the Chevron write down, 10 to 11 billion uh, charge this quarter, write down the value of some assets. Uh, they are citing lower commodity prices than Michael Worth was on Squawk a few moments ago. Business is good. Uh, we're leading our peers in total shareholder return this year. We've seen record production and free cash flow is growing. But good isn't good enough. So we're setting the standard higher for ourselves. We're streamlining our operational footprint. We're harnessing technology to drive efficiencies in our business, and we're simplifying our organization to get the right people on the right work, all of which are actions that will deliver even better results. I'm simply not counting on a structural lift in, a, in prices. No, I, I like Mike very much, but I would have done a totally different subtext if I had started. I would have said, first of all, we were not so stupid as to buy Anadarko at the top price. Right. Or XTO, by the way. Or XTO. As, as well, you're not allowed to talk about that. They get very angry when you talk about that. Both sides. Why? Exxon doesn't like you when you talk about it, and the XTO doesn't. You know what? Tough. It's not, David, it's, it's about friends, not money. I see. Well, it was a terrible deal. It was terrible. But nobody paid what natural gas was. That's a joke. Though. Natural gas was $9 when, when Exxon bought $9. XTO. $9. Now what is it? Two fifty? No, what it's actually it? minus one. <laughs> <laughs> They'd rather flare it than, than send it. Um, but I, I do think we got to focus on the fact that this man dropped out of the bidding for Anna Darko. Yes, he did. And that was that showed shrewd behavior. He he, he actually represents, I think, the, the traditional uh, people who run Chevron. They're worldly. They're also scientific. You know, he's also uh, talking, engineering. Right, he's talking about the future. He's like, hey, listen, the past is the past. Ten to eleven billion dollars, not an insignificant right. Oh, a lot of us more sell. It really is. It's not impacting the stock price. You can see it there. It, what it really does is shine a light on the challenges, of course, of Northeast yes. Gas, the yes. Appalachian shale plays. Um, they spent over what five billion dollars. Uh, Chevron has probably worth. Le- who knows what what those numbers are at this right. point? Which is why they need to write it down. But then when it comes to the Permian. They go to $4 billion in terms of what they're going to actually spend there. That's up 11%. Yes, well, that's, that's where the money is. Right, and that's and why I think they did. And remember, there is oil there. Of course, there's natural gas. Take a look at Apache if you want to know what natural gas looks like. Right. Uh, they had a they write down one of their assets in, in the Gulf, but uh, they did pretty well in the Gulf. They were the first ones to come. They never gave up after Macondo. They're just a very smart company in an industry that's really terrible. A lot of people have been saying, well, look, now the copper's moving up, oil's next. I don't know. I don't see it. Aluminum's not moving. What's the what's the play on on natural gas's dramatic fall? Is there a way, either shorting or, or some way to benefit? Yeah, well, Sempra. Here? Sempra's good. Uh, Con Ed. 
These are pass longs. I mean, they've got, actually, look, it's the reason why I like Sempra is because they have camera. It's the liquefied natural gas. Okay. That's the way you make money, because if you said liquefied natural gas, if our price is zero, and you get some of these countries that are beholden to us uh, start taking our natural gas, you make a lot of money. We're already it's, exporting a lot of natural gas. Yes, we are. Gas eight million, eight, eight BCF, eight billion BCF a day. It's going to take a little bit of a pause as these, uh, 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 by the way, it's the same thing with Mexico. That's the other guy. Of course, Mexico has more natural gas <laughs> than almost any other country, but Mexico has been underinvesting, so we send our natural gas. When you say countries that are beholden to us, which ones? Well, Poland is, is buying some of our natural gas, Korea. Uh, countries that, uh, that have had good trade, have had the run of the table of trade with us. Of course, Merkel continues to buy Putin natural gas. Uh, what? Uh, Japan also is a buyer of our, of our oh, yeah. buyer no, of everything. Yeah. No, we got of the our natural, natural gas. Yeah. Yes, so I, mean, I, I think it's one of the great export stories of all time. No one likes to talk about it because it's, uh, I think it's just really boring. But there are some gi- new gigantic train, they call them, of Cameron, which is Sempra, uh, going to start in January. One more huge amount of natural gas. We have so much natural gas in this country. Everyone felt that, what, well, the, the sages said that if we start exporting $8 billion, that the price of natural gas was going up. But as you heard from Chevron, I mean, Marcellus, Utica, the late, great Aubrey McClendon, telling me once that Ohio would be the biggest source of natural gas. And everyone laughed. Mm-hmm. No one's laughing now. No. I mean, big picture, sometimes we talk so often about technology companies, but the technology that has been brought to bear in the oil business over the last 20 years in terms of fracturing and uh, uh, horizontal drilling has dramatically changed it in in so many ways. And it's funny also, I mean, again, technology, we've been talking about biotechnology lately. That's all part of it is. Uh, the advances in tech that are reflected in various movements. Well, that's why the ring counts um, no longer. We used to, when I was at Goldman Sachs, which I mention constantly, I don't know why, uh, uh, they, we used to look at the ring count at Baker Hughes in the afternoon on Fridays. Well, now the ring count's kind of irrelevant because, frankly, we get so much more uh, oil, natural gas out of a ring than we used to. Right. I think it's great that you mentioned the technology well, because... That's, yeah. That's kind of an underlying theme that there's technologies made. I mean, remember how many people saying peak oil 15 years ago, whatever it was? Remember, peak oil. By the way, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Greenspan was talking about peak natural gas. It turns out that's when we were thinking we have to become an importer. And then the fabulous Sharif Suki, subsequently fired at Chenier, became a. David, I'm I'm, I'm talking. Sorry. I apologize. I know occasionally I like to insult my texts because I do have more people who know more than I do. I know, but me about in, the, in the middle of when I'm, I'm talking, sometimes I find it uh, humiliating. Well, I think you should get a thicker skin. Okay, thank you. Anyway, what we were saying, uh, stocks, uh, on track for a modest open. Uh, we've got some retail names under pressure today. Actually, a trio of disappointments if you count Home Depot, Jim. I'm getting tired uh, of Home Depot. Children's Place and AEO. Children's Place, obviously, I mean, they, they had some, they, they lowered the boom on themselves, basically just saying, look, the mall. Children's Place is very interesting. I, uh, Jane Elfers, in my life very much, she says uh, basically that, well, let's just say the mall is going to keep us from making a lot of money. Not as bad as GameStop. That may be the that may be the benchmark of bad, but I, I don't like what uh, Children's Place is. Due to meaningfully weaker than planned mall traffic quarter to date, we are lowering our outlook for Q4. Ooh. Home Depot, I said that, now my chapters are so Home Depot, we had a big gain in it, but I, I was critical of their last quarter, and they were critical of me. Uh, he who laughs, 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 laughed. Okay. Ooh, what a what? Well, I'm just saying, here they go again. They lowered their estimate. Now, I do think it represents great value. Well, they didn't like when you sort of were been so uh, pra- uh, praising uh, Ellison so much at Lowe's. That's well, you know, that's like. true. That's, yeah. that's probably part of it. Well, Marvin but, Ellison is doing great. I mean, it's not a dramatic. Um, they see 3 5 to 4, estimates 4 3. A similar spread on comps. It's not not that far of what they no, said. No, and we Q3 do have to hear spread. more because I don't really think that their guide could be okay. that quickly down from when they reported last time. But Marvin Ellison's back. It's a force. Remember, he worked at, at, at Home Depot. The stores were cleaner. Worked at Home Depot. Brief uh, brief stop at J.C. Penney. Decided that was not going to turn. J.C. Penney's a problematic retailer. It's in the mall. 
Yeah. By the way, I'm getting a lot of good uh, reports in my Twitter feed about the Kohl's Amazon deal, where you can return things yes. to Amazon from Kohl's. You get Kohl's cash, David. You get a discount. Mm. People are talking about Kohl's as being a destination, once again, but chiefly to return things from Amazon. But people have been looking for some sort of return on that deal. You're saying that it is I'm, going think, to actually... Well, I'm just... Because there have been questions about on the call and whether know, or not it, it's working. Well, Michelle Goss, so far, has been, been disappointing. Yeah. Uh, but I do think my Twitter feed, which is, I know, anecdotal, not empirical, does no. say a lot of people like to return things there and i don't know i mean i'm looking for retailers other than uh uh walmart amazon target costco that are doing well you mean you want to bring others into the watch fold yes and i do think that lowe's is i would like to do Kohl's, but i really can't because in the end it is brick and mortar macy's no children's place no american eagle no uh gamestop did you guys see the numbers gamestop gap no Gap, no. I uh, think GameStop, people were looking for $1.15 to $1.30. Now, it turns out it's going to be 10 to 20 cents. Same store sales down 23%. That's very hard to do. I mean, you got to literally close your stores in order to have that kind of number. GameStop. Yeah. Well, uh, Wedbush, uh, GameStop, uh, Michael Pachter, no. sticking by. Yeah. Oof. Wow. What? I mean, I people looked at GameStop on a lot of games it's, differently, it's, Jim. It's, it's below a six hundred yeah. million dollar market cap going lower today. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, look, the end of cycle uh, on or hardware, and then the broader move to digital. A lot of people, my terrible joke. Wow, Home Depot, you guys, she's Home Depot. Where's Carol Tomei when we need her? She's going away. Retired, right? We need Mel Torme at this point. Uh, but I do think that yes, yeah, she retired. GameStop, I don't know. I think it's too early to buy. Uh, my- I liked Mel Torme. Uh, uh, yes, me. yes, Mel got to meet him once. Mel Tor- Did you yeah, really? Yeah, just a prince. Really? Amazing man. Was he really? He was yes, very did he really nice. write? He did nice. he write that Christmas the Christmas song? Yeah, he, of course he wrote did the he lyrics really? on one of the hottest days uh, of the year. Uh, I and met, his estate makes a fortune every uh, every Christmas. I met Victor Moon. Nice one. <laughs> right? How about that? Who have you ever met? I uh, nobody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> even <laughs> even Barbara Streisand, you ever met Barbara Streisand? Never met Barbara. I met Barbara Streisand when I was a hedge fund when, manager. Back in the day when she used to watch Squawk Box, she was a she tr- would email. She was an IPO yes, flipper. Yes, People yes. forget. Uh, I don't know if she does anymore, but I never actually met her. I did. Fantastic. There's a big morning on tap. Exclusive interviews with uh, the co-CEO of Carlisle Group, the CEOs of UPS, CVS Health, B of A. But of course, we'll get Kramer's Matt Dash first as we count down to the opening bell on this Wednesday. Don't go away. This CNBC program. At Asda, packs of beer are just £12 each, including 24 bottles of Budweiser, 18 cans of Stella, or 12 bottles of Birra Moretti. Looks like you're hosting this year. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Budweiser, 300 milliliters Stella, 440 milliliters Moretti, 330 milliliters Exclude Scotland, drink aware. Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Want to power through your projects for less? Get 20% off power tools at the B&Q Tool Shop. Like the Bosch 18 volt 2 battery combi drill. Was £80, now only £64. You can do it when you're being q it. Excludes the wall 18 volt 4 amp combi drill, Dremel 3000 15 piece and power tool clearance. Ends 24th of November. In store only on 23rd and 24th of November. Subject to availability. From ESPN and the award winning producers of The Sterling Affairs comes the latest season of 30 for 30 podcasts. Four brand new stories of espionage. He wanted this team to be the Barcelona of women's basketball. Resilience. I started to scream. I tried to get away. Corruption. It's the culture of win at all costs. And rebirth. How will we ever rebuild it? 30 for 30 Podcasts, Season 6. Listen now to 30 for 30 Podcasts on TuneIn. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight. There's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily. Hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. 
MSNBC is on TuneIn. Get up-to-the-minute coverage on news and events from around the world with MSNBC's live 24-7 station on TuneIn. At home or on the go, stay up to date on the latest news and political trends with MSNBC's full lineup of shows, including Hardball with Chris Matthews. Hi, I'm Chris Matthews. Thanks for listening to MSNBC on TuneIn. And The Rachel Maddow Show. Plus, when news breaks, MSNBC has you covered with live updates, expert analysis, and more. Search MSNBC on TuneIn today. All right, it's hump day. At least what we like to call Wednesday here at Squawk on the Street. Of course, got an opening bell about 11 minutes from now. Let's get to a mad dash. Where are you headed? David, MKM Partners, I don't mention them enough because they do some provocative research. They're saying you be careful cannabis, that the uh, little cushion to cover payables, capital raises needed. The only two that they're really highlighting as being okay, Canopy Growth and Kronos. Now, of course, Canopy Growth took the money from Constellation. Cronus got some tobacco money. Four billion, right? Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. So when David Klein now runs Canopy, Would he's going to take that money, Jim. Go well, higher, huh? Well, no, no. It was, yeah, higher. <laughs> um, but David Klein, <laughs> David Klein, a very good CFO at Constellation coming in there, I think lending some order at Canopy. Look, when the smoke clears, they will be the winner. I like that. That was a good one. When the smoke, it's like one of those what we call teases in the business, but they make really funny things yes. when, on our when outro to commercials. Ever clear? I'm not sure they want the smoke to clear. No, they don't. Yeah. But this is the one that uh, if you really insist on uh, being in cannabis, I would recommend Canopy Growth because they do have a, a flight path, so to speak. Okay. But the bloom came off the plant oh, for did all it? of these Oh, things. my. And then what happens? They planted too much. Apparently, there's a 100-year supply of cannabis in Canada. Kind so of like natural gas in our country. It is. Yeah. Wow. Put That's it together. Good. Maybe there's something. That right. Can be I done. remember when I when my daughter lived in Oregon. They ripped oh out my all God, the. Look at. Cranes. I know. They ripped out all the Pinot Noir, uh, great Pinot Noir grapes, and yeah. they put cannabis in. They should have kept the Pinot Noir, although the northern Pinot Noir was a lot better than the southern Pinot Noir. All right, but, all right. Just to, so you're saying, if you want to. Bottom fish, canopy's the name to go in? Yes, and then also, also Kronos, oh, because Kronos they're capitalized. Too. The one that okay. they really highlight as being a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, suspect, is Tilray. Yeah. And Tilray likes to come on TV. I'd like to see Tilray's response, because they're saying that, uh, they're, that all Tilray may have, after everything, is $20 million available for inventory, capital expenditures, and accrued expenses. Tilray's promise of Portugal operations could help raise capital. Remember when Tilray... It was even higher than that. Wasn't yeah, well, I mean, there, there was, was that, that spike up. Yeah, where you couldn't borrow the if stock. If I were taller. So people wanted to short it, but you, the borrow was right. so prohibitive. That, that's the one that they yeah. would really say could be question. So I passed that on along with Home Depot. Okay. Because I'm just steamed about it. Um, well, I'm glad. Yeah, it's funny. Sometimes you lose sight of just how bad the moves have been. No, if you're you absolutely them, not right. Not to short them. Versus the drug companies. You had a great... The traditional uh, drug companies, like a Merck. Oh, my God. The move up, Warren's poll numbers, and the drug companies. Boom. All right. We're coming right back. We'll take a look at some of those pharma companies we're talking about. Squawk on the street. Counting you down to the opening bell. We're back after this. This CNBC program is sponsored by... Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. <laughs> Millions of people are missing out by having a current account that doesn't pay them any interest on their hard-earned money. TSB offers interest to all their Plus account customers for no monthly fee. Plus, you can stop your friends and family missing out by recommending the Plus account to them. And when they switch, you'll both earn £75. Search online or visit your local branch. Terms and conditions apply. Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. 
and for a little help. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tesco.mobile.com slash terms. Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Coming off two days of losses for the major indices, it is Fed Day. We'll get a decision at 2 o'clock and a presser with Jay Powell at 2.30. In the meantime, waiting for headlines on U.S.-China trade. The opening bell in five minutes. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial-free. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bates. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. This is Brian Musburger. Search the Better Network. That's the B-E-T-R Network. And then let us get you better prepared to better enjoy the day in sports. The NFL, college football, basketball, hockey, baseball. Sharpen your edge. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Be better informed. Be better prepared. Search the Better Network. That's B-E-T-R. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Some days life can get in the way of catching up on the news that moves your world. (laughs) Tune in is here to help. With live 24-7 coverage from CNN wherever you go on the TuneIn app, you can always find a slice of your schedule however long to check in on the biggest stories of the day. Hell hath no fury. The president's counselor went on a rampage on a taped phone call with Washington Examiner reporter. Search CNN on TuneIn to get the live news when it matters most. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut The sideline, the man bleeds for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. Fuck in the lane, turnaround jumper from eight feet is good on Search the Search NBA plus. today to start listening. You're watching CNBC Squawk on the Street, live from the financial capital of the world. The opening bell in two and a half minutes. Uh, busy Wednesday morning as we wait for the yeah. Fed decision at 2 o'clock. Dow's going to have to operate uh, without the benefit of Boeing, Jim, as the FAA administrator told our Phil LeBeau this morning that certification for the Max not going to come this year, as uh, Boeing had hoped. Yeah, I mean, Boeing have to be careful. They had to make this determination because of the way that they do accounting about whether it would be certified. But if... When I was watching Phil's interview, once again, I was struck by this discordant nature of hope at Boeing versus reality uh, with the FAA. And uh, think about all these airlines that are owed money. Uh, and Phil's been doing this reporting that basically just says, 
you know, you, you may think that Boeing's going to come out on skate, but not yet. Not yet. Uh, Journal's got this piece about uh, an FAA analysis, which might be released today, in which um, they, they found, given the initial problems after the first crash, could have averaged a crash every one to two years without agency intervention. Well, you're going to hear more about that. Breathtaking. Uh, look, Boeing. Let me. Boeing's going to come through this. Okay, they're going to come through this. Uh, you're going to want to. You're going to fly one of these planes, but they're not going to be done until everybody is sure that this thing is the most. It's like the safest plane on earth. And the, you know, a lot of the chatter is, well, the military would never allow this. Well, you know what? Uh, the pushback was, but we're commercial. But my friends, who I have a friend actually is in the, is involved with actual redundancy in the military who would tell you, look, they're going to have to end up being like the military. And if that's the case, well, it's going to take a little while. And also retraining, probably retraining the boots they mentioned. You have to do simulation work. NVIDIA is the way, by the way, to invest in simulation if you, so to speak, want to be in how to do simulations. Point that out. NVIDIA does the best simulations. They do? They also, you know, NVIDIA is running millions of car crashes a day in simulation in order to figure out what autonomous vehicles are going to do. And I think NVIDIA keeps coming up as a way to be able to talk about all the good things that are happening in the future. Let's get to the opening bell here. With all that in mind, get the S&P 500 to the CNBC real-time exchange and the big board uh, software analytics company New Relic celebrating its fifth listing anniversary at the NASDAQ. It's Brazil's XP Inc., a technology-driven financial services platform. Now, New Relic is an anagram for loose the CEO. If you actually do the letters, it's Lucerne New Relic, uh, which is like the Attack Lab, which is, of course, um, Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> what a book, what a movie. You probably don't remember. What movie? What book? Uh, I couldn't hear it. Rosemary's Baby. Mm. I watched it recently. Fan. It was scary. on. How scary? It's still scary. Yeah, it really is. It's still scary. Mercado. Yeah, was so Mercado. Young. Nice apartment they had in the Dakota. Yeah, where was that? It's, the Dakota takes you back. Roman Castabites. That was the the anagram. Right. Oh, Once right, right, right. Roman Castabites. John Castabetes was the. Yeah, right. Oh, he was so good. Yeah. He was wow. such a great actor. Oh, you got, did you ever meet him? I had never met <laughs> John Castabetes. <laughs> How old back you think I am? You could own an apartment at the Dakota for nothing. Uh, anyhow. Onward and upward. Yeah. Uh, as far as U.S.-China trade, kind of quiet today, guys. Bloomberg does have this piece uh, that says the, t the two sides are talking about maybe a reduction in the overall rate rather than rolling back or deferring December 15th completely. Look, I, I, I did a piece last night on Mad Money just saying, let's just wait to see what happens because it's too fluid. Uh, and I, I feel like that what people should be doing is thinking, if something good doesn't happen, are you ready with some domestic stocks to do well anyway, uh, just in case the futures take everything down? Uh, Reuters has a piece up, uh, citing a source saying that if the December 15th tariffs do happen, the talks are likely done for the remainder of the president's term. Is that, does that make term. sense to you? Yeah, that does. I know. There are uh, people in the administration who just say, why don't you walk away, given the, uh, the unemployment number. That was a, a, a fulcrum number. When that number was very good, I think the president felt emboldened to say, look, you know, we, we don't need the Chinese. Obviously, they're just like a USMCA. I mean, the people who love deals. Well, Wall Street people love deals. They want to see a deal. They want to see a deal. They want to see a deal. I, I remember speaking with the CEO of United, of United Parcel saying, that's a far more important deal than anything with China. That's interesting because FedEx has been saying what's important is China deal. Right. UPS continues to astound me as being the company that spent a fortune in order to be able to make money. I like the company. Um, we mentioned at the very end of the Mad Dash the move that healthcare-related stocks have made towards oh. the end of the year here, which continues. Whether it's the insurers such as UNH or just the big pharma companies. Yes. Including Bristol Myers. Bristol Myers. What a number after the Celgene deal. Twenty percent for the year. Well, the, the Celgene year. Giovanni. Earlier this year, it was in a bad place. Well, Dr. Cafario has um, made an amazing so acquisition. So much of this does seem to have been almost the day that Elizabeth Warren introduced her Medicare plan. Exactly right. And then That's, wait, everybody was like, "That costs a lot of that, money." That was the bottom. And then when she came out and said, "Listen, it'll be the third year of my term." You had to buy everyone. Will you look at that Bristol Myers chart? Yeah, Doctor I mean, Cavario. Then you can see a little dip, and then that latest move up, and that's Amazing. that's the same for many of these uh, healthcare-related companies. Uh, AbbVie is doing so well. Yeah, I don't know if you know 
what Yab the Allergan deal, I think it's going to prove to be a very prescient deal on the part of, Yeah, because they have the CGRP one pill, acute pill for migraine, right. as, as the spokesman for the American Migraine Foundation, David. Yes, which is not AMF like the bowling company. No. Uh, this is the got you know, this is the holy grail to be able to take a pill for migraine. And that Allergan has it. And it's going to be introduced in the first quarter. It's going to be very positive. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. still waiting for, obviously, the various approvals there. It's going to be a little while for that to close. You don't think it closes in the first, first, second quarter? I don't know, Jim. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just okay. saying don't. it's still waiting. But I think uh, these mergers are proving to be very strong, and they were done during the period when Elizabeth Warren was clearly the front runner. So. Uh, her poll numbers have certainly come down. Yeah, what is that? We'll see. Uh, it's early. How about what, uh, what Mayor early. Pete? What, what were some of the companies that Mayor Pete did uh, work on? No, he was in his 20s. Well, what does it even mean, work? Well, he had uh, Best Buy? Have you seen that stuff? I actually didn't see work. Do you think you can uh, relate his work to strength in Best Buy? I have no. no idea. The answer is no. I don't know. I don't know. No. Yeah. He was, How about Tesla? We have not talked him. about Tesla in no, a couple days. We're going to talk to Adam Jonas uh, later this we morning. We are? Yes, we are. Well, the royal we. Oh, my. Yes. He's terrific. Legendary Wall Street funny man. I mean, about <laughs> hey, analyst. <laughs> Sorry, there's a mistake. <laughs> you've, you've had your complaints with the way Morgan no, I mean, Stanley I structures their research. Well, you know, you one or five hundred. It's kind of like a or, double or zero 10. or red or black. I don't know. You go to a casino with that guy versus Pactor. <laughs> Pactor still still in the game stuff. Uh, speaking of Pactor, Netflix, that's, what, right? no, that's yeah. why it was a segue. Yeah. You know, we thank you for that. We've uh, we've uh, the UBS has been having their media conference, and yesterday we talked a bit about AT and T and also uh, Comcast. By the way, Comcast down another one and a half percent. Our parent company, its performance now trails that of the S and P after this year having outpaced the S and P virtually the entire year. Only thing I can point to is that two billion dollar number they used on Peacock, which I didn't think was going to be a surprise. Right. Uh, but stock has been down ever since. Kavanaugh, the CFO at UBS, a couple of days ago, talked about two billion over the first couple of years for Peacock. Five years till sort of break even. Um, but Netflix is up about 1%. Ted, Ted Sarandos, the chief content officer there yesterday, they're doing a few other new things. Um, uh, they talked about 26.4 million people having watched The Irishman, uh, at least in week one. That's 70% through, so that wouldn't include me and my family. We got about 50% through. We're still going to watch the other uh, My now. favorite moments when they were in the, at the Latin Casino. That's where, by the way, Jackie Wilson passed away. Ah, really? Yes. Wilson. Reed Petit. Uh, but uh, more importantly, they also talk about providing more transparent numbers to producers of programming for them. Sarando saying that we're doing more transparent reporting about numbers with our producers. We've informed all of them of the watching behavior of the show in the first 28 days, for seven days as well. So they know exactly how they're performing on Netflix. And then we've been able to release those numbers more publicly. That had been a criticism of the company that I'd heard from producers saying, we just have no idea how well, things are actually doing. And when it comes to renewal time, they have all the information and we have none. Well, have you seen yesterday, uh, Needham has a piece I've got in front of me, downgrading Netflix to underperform, talking about uh, domestic numbers going down. Yeah, we this did morning, that yesterday. Yeah, but this morning, more. Piper comes out and says domestic numbers are going to be up. They're talking about uh, a preliminary search index uh, says that there'll be subgrowth of 6% domestic. So you really have a... A real disparity oh, the, the here battle between is, these two. Uh, and, and Needham says 260. Uh, Piper, I think, reiterates 400. Isn't this something? Yeah. You usually, uh, that's a very wide disparity uh, in terms of people wanting to own Netflix versus wanting to short Netflix. Uh, I think that one of the things that they did in Piper was they talk about Netflix, the new metric, Netflix originals, how many they have. And they're up 3% year over year, uh, signaling a more engaging content slate. So this is really kind of institutionalizing the notion of what drives Netflix and stock original content. I don't know whether you think, whether you guys think that matters. I do. Oh, yes, very yeah. much. I, I watched. We, it's enough but, there for me and us. Yeah, we watch. Uh, Irish, our street was closed. Uh, for a week for Irishmen, uh, and they had all these cars, whatever. The segment that was actually was an assassination, and it lasted maybe seven seconds. Just shows you how expensive it is to make a movie. Well, what was, what was 175 million? Some that's the number, right? On on the Irishman, at least. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah, very, very close. Um, Meanwhile, there's a report that Disney now has 22 million. Oh downloads. my! I saw the stock up another dollar. Uh, by the way, the one, if you want to play that, you can also, not just Roku, Trade Desk. 
TTG. That's mobile app downloads in the first month. Yeah, that's it's mobile not bad. apps. It's not bad. No. A lot of people are very uh, it's being enjoyed in our home. Yes. Thank you, Verizon Wireless, for the first year free. You're welcome. Uh, streets a lot more unified on Apple uh, as Bamel goes to 290 and Evercore goes to 305. I think, Jim, that might be a street high. I was, boy, people just really want to get ahead of that next quarter. I hope they don't pump it too much. I know there's also some good stuff, uh, uh, frankly, about uh, three, about Qualcomm and how you might want to uh, own Qualcomm because of this. I, it, 5G is just a gigantic theme. Uh, I, but the 5G could drive three years of 200 million plus iPhone units. This is this BAM piece. 5G cycle could be smoother. You can't, you can't help but feel great when you read these. And uh, remember this stock where it was in January? It was at $120 lower. Apple. Yeah. Uh, it's stunning. 70% increase this year. For the largest. For the, second, for the second largest company. You have to correct well, yourself. What was now. the second largest? Oh, sorry. Uh, Ram Saudi Ramco. Ramco now. Yeah, Saudi the Ramco. largest U.S. Uh, market cap. The numbers, though, I mean, is it really that easy just come in and buy Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook and go home for the year? Is that well, really not all? Facebook, but the why, why not? Facebook is up 53 Yeah, but remember, Facebook year. lowered the boom in the third week of July of last year. It was horrendous. Yeah, but if you just took the pain and here you are. Well, okay, but that's not been a great stock, Facebook. There are better stocks than Facebook. Really? I'd take 53% <laughs> <for the year. laughs> Every single Double year. Double the market? No. Well, what, I mean, what, what's better? Smooth it year over year. Smooth and, it? Well, I'm just saying, if sure. you, it has not been a huge winner. If you look at some other stocks that have been huge winners. Roku. Okay. I, I'm, I'm losing you here. No, right. I'm just saying there's other. money manager well, go, out there would take, the, would take a 53% move. Go back to the drug stocks. You were doing so great with those. That's those are the ones that had to be bought. J and J now breaking through 140. Just yeah, like and your, your point's good. Uh, over two years, uh, Facebook has actually uh, underperformed the S and P. Right, versus say Lamb Research LRCX, which was recommended again today. Look at LRCX. I don't know if you follow Lamb. Only through you, Jim. Well, it's an amazing stock. You know, Lamb Research is a play on equipment. Look at that. That's what I'm talking about. Lamb Research. All right. That's what I'm talking Facebook's about. Up, right. All right. Chipotle. How about Chipotle? Oh CMG. On a CMG. Two -year stack. Yes. That is something. Yes. Carne asada, That's my incredible. friend. I am familiar with that as well. The carne asada. I am familiar with that as well. Two years. Chipotle, 160 percent. S and P, 17 percent. Well, there you go. And that is. Uh, Brian Nickel just killing it, crushing it. Double digit gain. Uh, same store sales. We mentioned Apple earlier, uh, and Tim Cook did come to the defense of monopolies in business while saying that Apple is not one. He told Nikkei, quote, a monopoly by itself isn't bad if it's not abused. The question for those companies is, do they abuse it? And that is for regulators to decide. Not for me to decide. Do we think uh, Apple's a uh, given safe? Samsung's play. Oh, I don't know. Monopoly. No. I mean, geez. If 